The history of Kempo in America is an interesting trip, albeit with an often bumpy road. Now, Ed Parker brought many martial arts influences to the country and contributed a major martial arts revolution in the United States. Today, we have a special guest with us. He was there in the beginning, training with Mr. Parker in 1959, all the way to Mr. Parker's death in 1990. He was the first 7th degree black belt under Ed Parker, and he took his knowledge of Kempo into his own direction and now runs the International Karate Connection Association. He was there in the beginning, he saw the transitions, and now he has established his own branch of the art, and he's here with us today to talk about the legacy of Kempo in America. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Master Chuck Sullivan. So first of all, I'd like to welcome you so much to our show, Mr. Sullivan. I really appreciate your time uh, spending with us. And uh, we actually got to speak to one of your students, Aaron Cohen, who gave us a little bit of insight on your system. He was a guest on our show, and he couldn't speak any more highly of you than he did and, and, and what you teach. So we're really excited to talk about your history in Kempo and where you've taken it today. You've got deep roots in the history of American Kempo, starting with Ed Parker. Um, how did you get involved in the art to begin with? <laughs> it's, it's kind of a funny story. And I'll tell it to you. <laughs> Other people have heard this before, but it's it, it, it's true and it happened. Uh, my brother-in-law came home, and uh, I had always wanted to study judo because it was the only thing available when I was a kid, And but it wasn't available to me. I lived in Chicago, and uh, there were no there was not, no such thing as a, as a dojo of teaching judo any place in the city. And even if there were, uh, financial considerations would probably have, have considered you know, it's impossible anyway. So I didn't get a chance. So I grew up uh, wanting to, and I, I'd done a hitch in the Marine Corps. I was out for five years, almost yeah, almost to the day, five years. And my brother-in-law came home one night and he said, uh, he lived with us. He had just got out of the Corps himself. And he said, did you know there's a judo school up on, on the boulevard, Tweety Boulevard, which is two and a half blocks from my house and a block over. And I said, no, I, well, where, where? And he told me. So I rushed up there and the place was closed. So I'm looking in the window, and there's some mats on the floor and a desk and a chair. That's, that's about it, really. And uh, then I'm, I'm really a little disappointed. The place is closed. So a couple of guys behind me are leaning against a car. One of them says, you interested in that? And I turn around. Two guys say, yeah, I am. Uh, how much does it cost? How much are the judo lessons? I asked. And he said, well, we don't actually teach judo here. I look up on the roof, and it's J-U-D-O. <laughs> Well, that's kind of funny. Okay, well, uh, there's some other words on the, on the on the window, and I said, "Well, what's this aikido?" And he says, "No, that's aikido." And I said, "Well, what is it?" He said, "Well, we don't teach that either." <laughs> now I'm looking for Alan Funt. I'm looking for a candy camera. They're pucking me, you know. And I, there was one more word. I'll give it a shot. K A R A T E. What is karate? And he says, "No, that's karate." And I said, "He rolled the karate." What? I never heard, what, what is it? They, they say it again, say it. I finally understood it, and I said, what is it? He said, well, it's it's a striking artist. This and, this and I'm thinking, we don't slam anybody down or throw anybody over your shoulder or, you know, through a plate glass window or nothing. Uh, well, he said, would you like to see somebody? Well, yeah. And he started showing me some stuff that yeah, was pretty nasty. Now, I'm not some 16-year-old kid fresh out of high school or in high school. I'm not easily impressed. I've been in the Marine Corps. I've met some killers, real get down for us. They got killers. And I, I knew what life was all about. And this kid was showing me some stuff that I said to myself, I wouldn't want to mess with him under any circumstances. So I got pretty interested right there. And I said, can I come by and watch a class? He said, yes. So I came back the next day. I think it was the next day. No, they were they only there two nights a week. That's all they were there, just two nights a week. So obviously, it couldn't last for long. If I hadn't got there when I did, I would have missed that opportunity, too. So I said, uh, I, I did. I watched. And uh, Jimmy Brown was teaching the class. He was a brown belt. And I said, wow, wow, well, wow, where do I sign up? Well, he didn't want to he, he, come again, you know, next time. And that, that's what I saw. The man. Ed Parker was he's a little, little over six feet. And he was trim and lean, all black hair except for one silver streak right in the middle. What I saw that night blew me away. That man had such energy that when he moved, it crackled off of him and it went through the walls and it permeated the building. And, and, and it, was, it, it was wild. 
So I said, you know, I'm in. I'm in. And uh, he says, so have a seat. Why do you want to study this art? What? I'm being interviewed to join his organization. And and I, I thought about, why do I want to study this? Well, for one thing, I was in nowhere near the physical condition I was in when I was a Marine. And I said, that's, that's one thing. I want to get in shape. I said, I, I see people pumping iron. I'm not interested in that. And uh, I said, this this read looks interesting. But I said, really, I said, the reason that I want it is the same reason I want car insurance, that I have to buy car insurance. I don't want to buy car insurance. I have to buy car insurance. Because when you need it, you really need it. The rest of the time, you don't need it, fine. I look at this the same way. I want it if I need it. But I'll never use it if I don't need it. Uh, it had been a uh, an Aikido school, and it had been run by an Air Force sergeant who would train the guys. And when he gets transferred, he'd leave his most uh, advanced student in charge. And uh, at this time, he didn't have an, a, a, an advanced student advanced enough. He, he sold it to Ed Parker. He said, "You know, I, I got nobody. If you want it, you can have it at a, at a decent price. Whatever it was, I don't know what their deal was." But uh, he said, why don't you do a demonstration for my guys? And if uh, if they like you enough, don't, don't come. he got every one of them. I mean, he did a demonstration. For, he got every one of them. I mean, he transferred right out over. And um, and then he closed up. And we had to drive. <laughs> there was two and a half blocks of a house. Now I had to drive 20, about 24 miles up to, up to Pasadena on surface streets twice a week after I got home in the evening. Fortunately, the class was late enough that I could attend it. And... Um, and I did. And as about half a dozen of us did. And then about three or four of us and then about two. And I finally just got that on my soul. That's how I got started. And uh, it, it's not a not a glorious story. I didn't, uh, you know, there was no trauma. No, no. It's just uh, something I, I, I saw. I, I, I loved immediately. I mean, immediately. I just, I, I fell in love. And, uh, and it just fascinated me. And it always has to this day. A lot of people don't realize that the the Kempo that Ed Parker taught back in the 50s is very, very different than what is known as Ed Parker Kempo today. Uh, can you tell us a little bit like what it was like training in that original system of Ed Parker Kempo? It was very simplistic. We had three major things with the basics. We trained on the basics. I, I can't tell you how we trained on the basics. I mean, that's all we trained on at first. And then we, we got into a little bit, we got into techniques, which are self-defense techniques and freestyle. We freestyled a lot. And, um, and then there was, there were the form, the forms aspect, which was a uh, very, very small at the time. But, uh, we trained hard and on the basics. I mean, we would, our geese would be clinging to us for, through sweat. It was relentless, uh, the basics. Now I saw people get so good so fast because we had so little to do as far as material. We just kept practicing the same thing over and over. Somebody once said, what would you rather, who would you rather fight? A man that practices a thousand kicks once a piece or the guy that kicks, practices one kick a thousand times? Obviously, don't put me with the one kicker because he's going to kick my butt. <laughs> that guy has got that kick down so, so incredible. I'll give you an example. Um, we do a snap kick to the groin. We use the ball of our foot. We call it a ball kick. We call it a ball kick for two reasons. Ed Parker said, once you use the ball of your foot, two, you're kicking the balls. So <laughs> it's a double, double purpose. That's how we use it. Now, Aaron has trained so hard in Krav Maga for so long. They use a shovel kick. It comes up, swings up, a pendulum comes up. Um, I've seen it done by other people. Don't care for it. And um, when I saw him do it, I said, don't. He says, I'm trying to get your kick. And I said, stop. You've got this kick down so well. Because I tried it. I, I couldn't do it at all. I, I, I had half the power that I had with mine. But this is because I trained with mine so long. I, I can get I get all the power. I get all the focus. I get everything. I said, then stop. Just don't even try to change it. Because what you got is fantastic. I, I like this because it's actually showing... Uh, right off the bat, I mean, I think that's kind of the nature of, of Kempo in general. It's like, look at see what else everyone else is doing and kind of find the value in that, integrate it into what you're doing. And if it works for you, great, keep it. If it doesn't, discard it. But at least being aware or being cognizant of what other people are doing and imp being able to implement that, I think is, is critical in the martial arts. Ed Parker once said, uh, 
He didn't care if the system was Zulu. He says, I'm going to find something good in it. And then he would, uh, you know, he would take from that. I'm, I'm a bigger thief than he was any day. I will take, I will see something of yours and take it in a, in a heartbeat. And sometimes you would even have to show it to me. I mean, how it's done technically. I could figure that out for myself. I've been in this long enough. I know how the body works, especially in relationship to uh, martial arts. That I can, you can, you can figure it out. Yeah, well, part of it's got to be understanding, you know, how to do the tool, but also understanding when it can be used and, and recognizing those openings to to make it effective. Yeah. Oh wow. Or um, it, it creates its own openings, or whatever. I mean, it's a, we have two techniques that I got from Jimmy Woo, because I don't know if you know about what happened with that Parker. During the early days, when he lost his entire advanced class, I can tell you about because I was there. <laughs> There's not many people around today who were there. Uh, Ed Parker was writing his second book, The Secrets of Chinese Karate. And uh, he was visiting San Francisco, picking the minds of some of the, the Chinese elders up there. And he ran into Jimmy Wu, who was nine years his senior. Ed thought it would be a good idea to have him collaborate with him on a book. So he invited him to come down to Southern California and stay with him at his house. So he supported him. I mean, he just supported the man on his, on his stay down. So they were collaborating on the book. Well, Jimmy Wu obviously looked at what Ed Parker had and looked at what he had, and there was no comparison. And then Ed Parker made a very serious tactical mistake. He put Jimmy in charge of the class, whatever he couldn't make it. And he couldn't make it more often as time went on. So Jimmy Wu got to teach the class and, and learn, get acquainted with all of the guys and start wooing them, pun intended, away from Ed and onto his own thing. And one of the things that he told, that he, he sold the guys on, because I stayed in contact with uh, one of the guys that went with him after he after he was there, so I, I got to know what they were doing, uh, how they were doing it, a little further down the line, not much, but a little further. And um, one of the things that I, I asked Leonard at the, this friend of mine, I, I said, uh, "How how did he get these guys? Because he didn't get me. I wasn't as as." close to the hierarchy of that class. I was kind of on the lower end. I was I had just joined the class of a brown belt. I was expected to be part of the move because he got every single person in the advanced class except me. I was the only one. But I would I didn't I didn't care for some of the things he was doing as he was doing it. I mean how do you expect somebody that lies in the corner with a cigarette in his lips and teaches you a class? What a cigarette in his mouth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First, I was just smoking while we were working out. There were just things about the man that that I just couldn't get behind. Some of the things I liked, some of the, some of the stuff I liked, but I didn't like it as an entire system. I liked little bits of it, so I stole them. <laughs> we have an assistant today. They're wonderful. Anyhow, um, so that all happened, and and they split. And one of the things that he told about was. He said, Ed Parker has taught you everything he knows. Come with me. I'll teach you the real thing. Well, he didn't have the real thing to begin with. He was more of a con man than, than they, they. And he said, another thing is, he said was, Ed Parker's moving too slow, meaning that he should be, his, his school should be all over the country. You should be in charge of the East Coast. This guy be in charge of the Northeast. This guy be in charge of the Midwest. This guy be in charge of the South. This guy, that didn't happen at all. That never happened. The furthest they ever got was the, the crappy end of Hollywood Boulevard. That's where the dojo lived and stayed and died and whatever. Anyhow, uh, Jimmy Wu had some some um, some really good stuff, but selectively, not as an entire system. As an entire system, it was horribly lacking. But the thing that he impressed me about these guys was Ed Parker taught him everything you knew. So Ed Parker obviously said to himself at that time, "You want more? Oh, I'll give you more." I'll give you so much you can't handle it. And that's what happened.
Um, there's um, some really fascinating old footage, the black and white footage of you, Mr. Parker, running through the techniques. And I love those clips. I love seeing, it looks like they're technical videos. Like, what was the purpose of those? Were those more for documentation? Were they instructional videos? What was the objective behind filming those, those Kempo films? Beautiful that you should ask. The, uh, the real objective was, at that time, the early 60s, so few people had seen Kempo. And, you know, Kempo was nothing till you see it move. His books were wonderful, but a book is a book is a book. And if a, if a word, if a, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a motion picture has to be worth a million because it moves. You can see the dynamics. You can see the person doing it. You can see it. It's, you can see what's happening, the cause and effect. And what I said to him was, we, we got to make some films. And eight millimeter film was the only thing was uh, in, every, in every household at that time. And it pretty much every household did have it. And, uh, and I said, well, do it in eight millimeter. And, and, uh, so I, I proposed to him. I said, uh, because he's who he was and because I was who I am. I said, we'll, we'll do this. I'll, I'll do all the, uh, the technical stuff. I'll get all the equipment. I'll do all the advertising. I'll take the orders. I'll fill the orders, all like that. We'll do a 60, 40 split, 60 to you, 40 for me. And he said, well, let me think about it. So the next time we got together, we used to work out after the class was over. He, he and I was just, he was teaching me things that, well, he was teaching the other class, but he, I think he sort of tested out. I mean, then he teaches the class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we got together the next time, and I said, uh, oh, "By the way, have you have you thought about you know my proposal?" He said, yeah, "I love it. It's a great idea." But that sixty forty says that ain't gonna work. And I thought, "Oh, okay, I overstepped my bounds. <laughs> What's it gonna be? Seventy five, twenty five, eighty twenty? And you know." And he says, "No, Chuck." It's got to be 50-50 out of one. Really, he knew that I was going to be doing so much more than he was doing. And he told me, he says, anytime you need me to be in a play or whatever, you tell me what you need ahead of time. He says, I'll be there and I'll have it. And he did. He, he's a marvelous uh, partner. We got along. We, our partnership was, was beautiful. What's great, though, is like watching these films back, and they're still pretty intact out there. Um, th I like how you guys did it, you know, applied them on each other, but then you did the step by step walkthrough. So, as a student at that time, they could learn it in person and get that instruction, and then use that film later as a as a resource or a reference if they just needed to kind of remember a step or a technical uh, detail. I think those films really, really serve well to preserve the art. And of them, um, I have one of his books here. Um, this is a Parker book. Is that the same material? Because I saw a lot of similarities in the film to this book this, yeah the, yeah pretty much same curriculum pretty much yeah yeah so well i, I had <laughs> that's another thing he put the uh the syllabus on me he said i'm not gonna have time for that you have i thought he was gonna do it. naturally it's his system I, I figured he was gonna do it no 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 uh, uh, no you do that and he says and, and you take half of what you know half the technique i want you to do half and i'll do half so what prompted uh, Mr. Parker to change from this set of curriculum to start to adapt it into what is known as American Kempo today. And what was your involvement and your, your overview of that when it started to happen? Well, like I said before, I saw people get so good so fast and come around the seventies, nobody was making black belt. Nobody was getting their black belt anymore. I mean, it just seemed like everything stopped for a while. Um, the, the syllabus had gotten so big. When Vic LaRue was uh, managing the Ed Parker School in West L.A., uh, I quit teaching basically his syllabus in the 80s. Uh, in fact, when Vic opened his uh, Karate Connection on Hawthorne Boulevard in, in uh, Hawthorne, he wanted me to be head, head instructor. And I said, uh, what are you going to teach? He says, well, we're going to be at Ed Parker School, so we're going to teach, you know, Ed Parker syllabus. I said, the whole thing? He says, yeah. I said, no, I'm not interested. Uh, I said, what time the, uh, the, the beginners is the beginners class? And he said, well, you don't teach the beginners. You only teach the advanced class. I said, you haven't got an advanced class. <laughs> You're just starting it. Where are you going to get an advanced class? Well, the old guys are going to come back. I said, no, no, no. The old guys are gone. Don't count on the old guys. You're going to get a new set of old guys. <laughs> That'll be the, the ones you're creating now. So he said, well, you don't, you don't teach the basics. And that's, that's like beneath you. I said, the really... The head guy should always teach the basics, but that never happens. To me, that's the most exciting part. Anybody can teach an advanced class. You don't teach an advanced class. You just conduct a class. They know the stuff. They know the material already. But you're teaching them the basics. And I, I asked Vic, I said, who taught you your basics? Because you did. I said, all right. Were you satisfied with them? Well, yeah. I said, 
I'm going to teach these people too. And I did. And I did because the basics are the most important part of the art. That's, that's what makes everything work. And I'm curious now to use that as a transition into uh, the International Karate Collection. Um, how did that get started? Like, how did you return back to that with Mr. LaRue? And, and how did that system start to develop from that point on? Well, the, uh, well, first of all, he started the Karate Connection. And he, he had that for about five or six years. And then uh, he moved out to the desert. His, bo- his mom became a widow. And he was an old child. And uh, he moved with his mother out to the desert to be with her and, and get her established and all like that. And uh, he was coming into, into town two nights a week, 250 miles, <laughs> two nights a week to be, be, be in Ed Parker's class. So we were still in, in, in Ed Parker's class. We never cut our, you know, our relationship with him at all, ever. And um, he was he was coming into that. Well, then eventually, all right, here's what happened with, with you're talking about the uh, video syllabus that we created. All right. Um, that's an interesting story too, because Vic kept coming at me. We got to make videos. I said, no, we don't. He said, but we got to, everybody's doing it. I said, ask me if I care. I don't care what everybody's doing. I'm not going to do what everybody's doing just, just because they're doing it. I said, no, I said, video first, Vic. I said, look, I tried teaching by eight millimeter film. Can't be done. I said, video is the same thing. You can't teach my video. You can barely teach this with people standing in front of you, for God's sakes. And uh, one night, we are standing right in my, in my driveway, and I remembered something that had happened a few years earlier. I think he must be in class, and he says, hey, he says, I heard a, a story about Chuck Norris you'll get a kick out of. So what is it? He didn't realize that Chuck and I were friendly competitors, but put the emphasis on friendly. Well, he says, Chuck Norris wanted some... Um, rank on his black belt, but he, he couldn't afford a trip to Korea, so he sent an 8 millimeter film. <laughs> what do you think of that? I said, I think it's great. I said, really? I didn't think you'd go for that at all. So why not? If his instructors told him what they want to see, and he showed it to them, what's the difference if he's standing there doing it, or if it's just on, you can't mess with 8 millimeter film. There's no such thing as special effects. So, if he sends them to him, I said, I think it's great. And all of a sudden, I said to Vic, I said, you know what? There was practically no home video in 88 at all. But it was coming. And I knew that. I knew it in, instinctively at the time. This is what's going to take over 8, uh, eight millimeter film. And it did. And it just killed the 8 millimeter film industry. I said, if somebody sends us, first of all, we tell them what we want to see. We show them what we want to see. A test in karate is not like a test in school. It isn't how much you know, it's can you do it? We know you know it because you've been in a class learning it. So we know you know it. Can you do it? We want to see you do it. That's what's going to convince us. That's what's going to elevate you in ranks. So I said, you know what? I said, now, I said, with video and being able to speak and, and tell them what they're doing wrong and show them what they're doing wrong and tell them what they can do, how they can do it right and show them how you do it, we're going to get them to do it right. I said, sometimes it's going to take more than once. Now we got to put the whole thing on, on video. This is going to be a bear. Well, it took us two years, two years of planning. Because the two years we spent four nights a week in my, my little dojo here, going through every technique in the Red Book, the Big Red Book. I don't know if you heard about the Big Red Book, mm-hmm. but it contained all of, all of Ed Parker's techniques till that time. And we, we just... Went through that book and I just crossed that, I crossed that, I crossed that. And I look at this and I said, I, mean, I like the beginning of this, the ending is of it. We keep the beginning. And we go to the ending on another one. And that's so on. And we finally, it took two years of culling through that book. We did it because we knew we had an agenda. We knew we, we, we wanted to teach it, how we wanted to teach it, and so on. So we knew we had to do that if we we're going to keep it American couple or Chinese couple, which is paying homage to its origins, its origins. That's, that's basically why we call it Chinese candle. This is the transitional point then from the material that you're teaching now from at Park material. This is the, yeah. the beginning of the roadmap to what you're teaching today. Yes. Breaking down the techniques was very insightful. We kept the best and throughout the rest. Basically, that's what we did. We, we examined it to the point. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of our couple people like, have preferences. They like 
So you know, some techniques over others. Why? Because they work. So I want to touch upon that too, because I see a lot of issues with today. I mean, yes, the number one problem is the, the curriculum is massive. And I've heard a lot of different stories, a lot of people talking about what they like, what they didn't like. But there seems to be a lot of scrutiny against Kempo because um, there seems to be people who just focus on memorizing the techniques versus taking the time to break them down, like what you guys did, stripping them down to the cores, finding the values, finding the principles, and taking what works. Um, so when you really strip down Ed Parker's Kempo, there's a lot of academic information there in terms of principles and rules, concepts. How much of that did you keep intact for your system, or did you start from a whole new uh, fundamental level, basically, from the ground up? We, we did that. We basically started from the ground up. We even changed some of the, uh, some of the basics. Like uh, the neutral bow, uh, we raise our we raise our rear heel because it loads up that rear leg, and it allows you to move much faster. I got that. I, I saw that in, in Steve Muhammad, who started out in life as Steve Sanders. Uh, he was a, he was in our school. I promoted him all the way up to black belt, and, and you know, he he calls me his his teacher. I learned as much from him as he did from me, simply because he was a natural. I mean, there are things that we picked up along the line. If you're observant, good for you. If you're not, <laughs> too bad. You're going to miss a lot. You've got to be watching. You've got to be – you're always learning. We're always learning. Yeah, I'd like to re uh, return back to the topic of putting together the video program because at the time you were doing this, like you said, you were coming from the 8 millimeter films, and now you're seeing the benefit of these, these video cassettes with sound and color, and you can do more instruction with it. What was your overall reception when you tried to implement – so once you guys actually put down your core curriculum and you recorded it, and you're trying to cultivate it and spread it out there, did you get a lot of pushback? Was there a lot of st stigma from it? Oh! Criticizing? Oh! 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 I, I, I'll quote you from somebody that was high ranking. He said, I can't believe what some people have done to the system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, but, but pushback? Oh, God, yeah. Now, would Ed Parker have, have agreed? I don't know. I, I don't know. He came about just before he died, but he never got a chance to see it. We had actually made the, uh, we were working on it while we're still going and then visiting him and, and working out. You know, one night a week uh, at his place. If we always maintain that uh, that um, relationship, you know, when uh, when I started, he knew everything and I knew nothing. So naturally, I, I deferred to him on everything until a certain time. Now, what about from the technological point of view? Now you're promoting, you know, you start putting your curriculum on video and sending the video out. And even even just a few years ago, there was a lot of scrutiny about learning video online and websites through video. What kind of pushback did you meet at that time in terms of the method of teaching and distributing this content through video services? Well, in the beginning, a lot of people did say, you can't teach through video. You can't teach through video. Then along came the pandemic and all of a sudden, sudden everybody's teaching through video. Yes, you can. As long as you're, as long as you have a relationship with, with your student where you can show him what he's doing wrong and tell him how to do it right and then watch him do it right. Now you're teaching. It's absolutely no different than teaching in person or teaching by, it, it takes longer. Now today, oh my God, today it's so great. Everything is done through the computer. You can, you can have it right now and you can get your, your reply right now. It's fantastic. Of course, the people that we've, that we've trained, I'll tell you, I put up our black belts up against anybody's. Anytime. Now, I understand, too, um, I was talking to Aaron. He said that you guys have a, a master kata required for black belt. Can you tell us a little bit what that is? It's all 55 techniques put in in, a, uh, in, in one kata. So the master kata is the only one that we have the best for. Well, we, we also, I also teach the two-man set. I teach the staff set. And I teach short form three. I like short form three. And once yep. they go through the program, what happens when a student reaches black belt? Is there still are there other levels of black belt degrees? Is there more curriculum past that, or is it more uh, just time and grade in the system? How does how does the journey proceed past black belt? We have sanctioned every black belt that has come through the system, no matter how many generations down the line he is. One of our brown belts, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, one of our black belts uh, recently wrote to me and it said when. Are we going to be able to promote ourselves? Nobody can, can promote to black belt except the organization. It has to be sanctioned through the organization. So every black belt has come through, through the organization. See, with, with Ed, where he lost it was he made me a black belt. I made a black belt. That black belt made a black belt. That black belt made a black belt. And that black belt. 
So before you know it, the last thing Ed Parker said to me before he died, which is, I think, three days before he passed away, he said, I don't know what to do. And I said, what do you, what, ooh, what's the problem? He says, I want to go out of these promotions. And I sit there. And the only thing I recognize is the names of the techniques. It's too late. It, 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 that ship has sailed. It's gone. It's so hard it was to gone the minute people. that you didn't see who I promoted for black belt. And after that, the minute he did, you didn't see his, his or his. You get three generations. Now you have absolute. You, it, it's like, like I said, the only thing he's going to recognize is the names of the techniques because they've all been changed. But yet they're doing it in his name. They're a Parker Black. No, they're not. No, they're not. So just... with us, um, they yes, there's ten degrees, and um, and and at tenth degree, that's that's it. Thank God they, they capped it at ten. I hate to think of us like the Masons, a thirty second degree black belt. The 10th degree is, is it. Now, had Ed Parker stayed alive, had he remained alive to, to my age, he might have been able to hold the line. He might have been able to do that. And I mean throughout throughout the arc, because if, if we didn't go any higher than, than he had mandated, see, with him, the, the deal was you could only come to within two of him, two degrees of him. So the highest anybody could ever reach is eighth. So if I was an eighth, the highest I could promote would be seventh. So that means you would have to go to him for the eighth. So he would he would always keep it in house, and the highest anybody would ever have gotten would have been eight. I didn't have it. I was happy with seven. I was one of the the handful that that, that made seventh under him. Uh, oh, like I can start to tell you about this 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 fellow that black fellow says, "When are we going to be able to promote ourselves?" I said, "Never." He said, "Really?" I said, "No." That's what makes us so unique. Every black belt that's come through, no matter how many generations down from the source, no matter how many generations has come through the system, we have seen him. We have sanctioned the black belt. We have tested him. He does his, his test through us, and either he gets it or he doesn't get it. He takes it again, and he takes it again. See, Ed Parker got started at a time when it, it didn't even exist. I mean, nobody thought about that. Yeah, right? well, he started at the time when nobody knew what the word karate meant. <laughs> That's right. No, 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 no. At that time, you started asking earlier, uh, if people knew, they, they didn't even know what the word meant. Nobody in, in 1959, when I started, knew what the word meant, except for the very small handful, and I'm talking a small handful of people that knew Ed Parker personally and were involved with him. Otherwise, they had no idea what K-A-R-A-T-E stood for or how to say it, because we all said karate at the beginning, and inside of that, a customer of mine said, well, Chuck, is, is that anything like karate? <laughs> karate? Is it, is, I said, it's supposed to be the same thing. It's supposed to be, I tried to explain it. It's supposed to be pronounced this way, but they, we lost that battle, obviously, a long time ago. It never, it never popularized as karate, but it did as karate. I mean, really, of, of, of all the people who know what, what karate means, I doubt whether uh, 10% of them know what, what Kempo is, is all about. Kempo never got popularized beyond the people that are in it and, and has studied some other systems also. They have made a study of the systems. I got I was lucky. I could have gotten involved in Shotokan. I could have gotten involved in Tanks to Anything. I really um I was very I have been <clears throat> I've been able to study with anybody I wanted. I mean, I knew all the gunners. I knew all the I, I know all the guys, I know their systems, I've I've seen them all, <laughs> I've made a study of them, insofar as I want to I want to learn about them and what they are, and except for Bruce, uh, I could have studied with Bruce, but I don't think I would ever have forgotten my Kempo background either, like Danny Anasano, he's uh, he's he's got his own thing, but he's he's still got a, he's a lot of Kempo in it. So starting from where you did with Ed Parker and, and his first version of Kempo as it transitioned into American Kempo and as you guys started to craft your, your current Chinese Kempo system, what is in the future or what do you hope for the future of your current Chinese Kempo? What would you like to see it happen or happen to it? Um, I am grooming the next generation because I'm an old dude, man. I mean, I've been around since... <laughs> 
I'd like to say it's as great as her white belt. But anyway, <laughs> so at 91 years old, I'm, you know, I'm, um, I'm getting there. And I know I'm not going to be around for forever. So I'm, I'm grooming the next generation. And I've got people behind me that are, are going to be taking over. And they, they're already doing more within the situation, within the organization than I was willing to do after a big retired. So uh, I, uh, I, I didn't want to do it. And I, I've put them, given them the responsibility of, of doing certain things and they're doing it. So I think the IKCA is going to be alive and well for a long, long, long time. And I think that, see, when Ed Parker went, everything went to hell. Everything. It just imploded on itself because he had no line of continuation at all. He had nobody to continue it on. He had delegated anybody to do that. I don't know if he could have. I really don't know if it would, if it would have been possible under the, the situation that he had. Being sole ownership and everything, I, I just, I don't know. But I've, I've, made, I've made damn sure that, that the chronic connection is going on without me, with or without me. In fact, I'm down to right now, I'm, I'm only responsible for six degree and above. I've given the responsibility for the promotions to these other people. And um, I'll do it as long as I feel like doing it or as long as I can do it. But uh, beyond that, uh, the, it's going to be their responsibility. And I see it being uh, more powerful and stronger as, as, the, as the years go by. Um, and as far as the, the self-defense part of it, until man develops another arm to block with or punch with, or another leg to kick with, we're still working with the same equipment. So, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be good for a long, 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 long time. And um, I guess my final question to you is, um, is there anything that you wish you would be asked that you haven't been asked about your system? You've done a hell of a job. <laughs> you really have. You've, uh, you've gotten into the, into the, uh, the little corners and uh, creases of it uh, to the point where, uh, I really don't think so. I mean, even down to like like this last thing about you know what what do I see in the future for it? Uh, uh, strength and and unity and um, a continuation above all. So uh, uh, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate uh, what you've done for this afternoon. Well, I definitely like to thank you so much. I mean, this was very insightful. I I I. I... I've known several people who have trained in, in the Karate Connection, and they've always said very positive things about it. And I was really curious to uh, talk to you about it myself. Like I said, speak with Aaron Cohen. He he he, said he can't he can't talk enough about you know he can't talk it up enough. And um, I want to thank him for kind of putting us in contact with each other because this was there's so much history here, and there's so much and I think important history. And um, I it's I think it's important to realize where roots come from. And how they develop, because, you know, things are going to keep developing in the future. 100, 200, 200 years from now, who knows what's going to be popular those days. And I just think this whole idea of understanding legacy and where arts go and how to maintain the core elements of what work, I think, is a vital part of being a martial artist. So I just really thank you for your time today and sharing your experience and perspective with us. This was a phenomenal eye-opener for me. Wouldn't it be interesting to come back 100 years from today, just for a day, and be able to turn on the... Your, your computer and look at it and see, uh, put, put a couple karate and see where it's gone in the last hundred years. Woo. Well, thank you so much just for your time. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, we look forward to seeing what comes of the of karate connection and, and what comes in the future. So again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. We'd like to thank Master Sullivan for his time sharing his history with us today. I am always fascinated to talk to those who will travel on a different Kempo path. So many similarities, yet so many differences, but we can always find something that we can learn from. Now, if you'd like more information on his system or online training program, there is a link to his website in the description below. Now, for those of you who want to get into a more gritty debate about Kempo, we talked to one of his students, Aaron Cohen, who served in the Israeli military and works as a tactical advisor in Hollywood. Now, we get into some of the more uncomfortable conversations that many Kempoists don't like to talk about, so let's go.